song, but it's a recently reinterpreted hymn that we heard recently and thought it'd be a good one for our congregation. Oh, 
still before you, and you will speak to us. And I pray that we will do that today. Just help us to be still before you. And I ask that your strength would be made perfect in our weakness. And that everyone hearing this today would just feel undergirded with strength. Just feel you holding fast to them. No matter what they're going through, whether it's just being in their homes, whether they're struggling with that your hand would be ever present and that we would feel your presence and know that you are holding us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm glad that you have decided to join us again. Um, if this is your first time with us, I um, am, am a pastor that walks around a lot. I move from side to side, it just makes me feel more comfortable. It makes me feel like um, I'm at home and we're just talking um, and going through God's Word together. You know, this is 
uh, a new day, a new dawn, a new age, um, and a new normal. And we are beginning to figure out what our new normals are. And hopefully um, they won't be the new normals for very long. Hopefully that we can um, uh, learn how to do some things, that this will get better, that uh, Christ will intercede, and that um, we will have um, a new way of doing things, which would be the old way a little bit. Um, and so I want to remind you of a couple of things that we do as a church. First and foremost, um, at 6 o'clock, uh, we just stop wherever you are and we pray. Um, we're praying about um, our country. We're praying about the leadership. We're praying about uh, the, the virus. We're praying about um, revival. And that's really what I hope that uh, the things that we are taking the time to pray. So that's at 6 o'clock every evening, if you would. Just stop wherever you are. Take your family. Um, and pray. The other things that we're doing is that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, we're doing a devotional. I'm posting that on Facebook. Um, you can uh, find that and and share that with your. Usually they're two, three minutes long, um, not very long at all. Um, just kind of a quick devotional so that we can uh, just be in God's Word together. And then of course um, on Sunday mornings we are um, posting this at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, to um, be in place of church because we're not allowed to gather together. Um, and so hopefully uh, you're tuning in. Feel free to share it um, to get uh, more and more views That just that the word gets out. My dad is a pastor. My brother is a pastor. Um, and so we sit down on Sunday mornings and start watching all of our sermons. Um, and then we call each other and go, that was pretty good. You should have maybe talked a little bit about this or... That was pretty good. Maybe, what about this scripture? And, and um, you know, we're trying to figure out where we go from here. Um, and so it, I'm, I'm lucky that I have them as a resource. Um, this morning, if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read verses 15 and 16. Um, but then I also want you to uh, make a mark or, or flip over into Luke chapter 19, uh, verse 36. We're going to talk about two very different uh, series of events this morning. This morning is Palm Sunday. Um, that's why I thank you uh, for those who decorated um, our church. It's beautiful um, so that we have something that we can, uh, some pr something pretty to look at other than myself. Um, so um, there's two, second, two series of things that happen in these two scriptures, and I want to go through uh, both of them. But before I do, I want to tell you a little bit, uh, as I told you, I try to bring my daughter, my family, my son, somehow into the message. And, and this morning is no different. Um, one of the things that my daughter is doing, her name is Summer, and she's uh, two and a half, she's almost three years old. One of the things that she is doing uh, now is every color is her favorite color. And so she likes to choose the shirts that she wears, the pants that she wears, the dresses that she wears, the spoons that she eats off of, because it's all her favorite color. You never know what is truly her favorite color. It is changing from moment to moment and day to day. And she changes her mind very, very rapidly. Um, and so as we were sitting there eating dinner, she was going to eat some uh, yogurt or something. I don't really remember. And so I hand her a spoon. She goes, not the blue one, the pink one. And I go, okay, well, why? Well, pink's my favorite color. Well, you just said that blue was your favorite color. And so there's no... Uh, we're very confused sometimes by what is her favorite color. And as she does color things, those are uh, things that she does. She said every color she picks up, it's her favorite. It's endearing, but there's no real way to know which one is her favorite color. My son, Micah, is now in the fifth grade. And one of the things that I heard while he was in fourth grade was, I hate fourth grade. I am done with fourth grade. I want to... Just be a fifth grader. He would sit in my car on the way to school. Daddy, I just want to be a fifth grader. I don't ever want to go to fourth grade again. I'm done with fourth grade. About two weeks into fifth grade, I'm done with fifth grade. I don't want to be a fifth grader. I want to be a sixth grader. I'm ready to move on. I don't want to be here anymore. And then he would say, this, this is my uh, favorite subject. And then all of a sudden it starts changing. It's not my favorite. I can't stand that subject anymore. I think we have a lot to learn uh, from them um, and, and, and also from our scripture lesson because 
we do see that there's two different responses in here to Jesus Christ. And we're going to go through them hopefully this week. Next week, obviously, um, is going to be something I hopefully uh, special. I would love to think and pray that revival would break out on Easter Sunday um, in your very own homes and that you would be able to worship uh, with your families. Um, and so as we look into Matthew chapter 27, verse 15 and 16, I'm going to begin reading. It says, Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus or Barabbas? And who, who they called out the Messiah. And so for he knew it was out of self-interest that they had let him go. And so the pilot ended up going, it was a custom that they would go together at, at this festival and they would release one prisoner and Barabbas was somebody that was violent and they was, he was a well-known prisoner. And then the people were given the option to say, do you want Jesus to be released or do you want Barabbas? Because Jesus claims to be the Messiah, but Barabbas is a well-known, a well, well-known criminal. If you flip over to Luke chapter 19 um, in verse 36, if you would follow along with me there, it says, As he was and went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near uh, the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, uh, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. If you read these two Scriptures, you can understand that there are two different things that are going on here. There's two different series that are happening. One is that there's a party. First of all, Jesus on Palm Sunday, He's riding into the city. And man, they are having a party. They are praising God. They are screaming His name. They are laying palm branches on the road for him to, to go down. I can, I can only imagine that it was something like about a three-year-old birthday party. If you've ever been to a three-year-old birthday party, this is the scene that I think is going on. Just people running out of jubilation for no apparent reason. That's what happens at a three-year-old birthday party. Screaming, so happy, they don't even know necessarily what they're celebrating and they're running around screaming yelling names and this is what they were doing for jesus people were just going from place to place screaming and praising his name yelling hosanna blessed is the one who comes in the name of the lord this happened on sunday he's going down the road and all the people are praising his name and yet on friday then we get the second series where it talks about Pilate letting Barabbas go and keeping Jesus um, and getting ready to crucify him. I want to dissect uh, some of this a little bit uh, because here's, here's a quote that I found by Billy Graham. I'm not too much on, on doing quotes, but if you're going to quote anybody outside of the Bible, quote Billy Graham. He says, The greatest mission field in our country today is in our local churches. The people that are sitting in the pews. The greatest mission field that you can see um, or that we have are the people who come to church. And I wondered, I started thinking, why, why would he think that? Why does he think that the greatest mission field are the people who are coming to church, who are going to church? And here's what I've come up with. I'm not sure if it's true, but here's what I believe. Is that the people who are sitting in the church know what to say. They know how to say it. They know when to say it. They know how to act. But that doesn't mean that they have a relationship with Christ. In these two stories, you can see how people knew how to act, right? They knew what to say. They knew that, that when Jesus went by, they would scream, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our long-awaited Messiah. These people in this crowd, they knew exactly what to say. And yet, less than a week later, those are the same people that are screaming out, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, put him away, crucify him. 
I think what Billy Graham is meaning in, in his statement is that when the rubber meets the road, you start finding out how deep your loyalty is to Christ. When the rubber meets the road, it really shows what kind of relationship you have with Jesus Christ. So in this, in this, these two scenarios in the Bible, we see what kind of relationship these people had. We see what kind of relationship they had with Him. On one hand, they're yelling and screaming and praising His name. On the other hand, they're yelling His name out saying, we don't want Him anymore. We want to crucify Him. There are reasons why that there was a change of heart. Right? There was reasons why there, that the crowd had a change of heart. I mean, you think about it. To go from we love you, you are our long-awaited Messiah, in less than a week to going, we want to kill you. There was a significant, significant change. I want to give you some possibilities of why there was a change. Why there was a change of heart um, amongst the people in the crowd. First, their words did not match their actions. Their words did not match their actions. Their words did not match the commitment that they have made to Jesus Christ or the perceived commitment that they had made. And so as they were screaming and shouting and saying, Hosanna in the highest, their words didn't match what was in their heart. Their, mer- their words did not match the relationship that they found in Jesus Christ. What it boils down to is that they had a casual relationship with Jesus Christ. And in that, they didn't have a deep-rooted relationship. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 26. It says this, Whoever serves Me must follow Me, and where I am, My servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves Me. This is very important. This is a very important verse in the Bible because what is it talking about? It's talking about how we serve Jesus. How we serve, if we serve Him, then we are in with Jesus and Jesus is in us. And so I believe that there's first reason why they had the change of heart is because their words didn't match their commitment. Second is because they had a casual relationship with Christ. And thirdly, I think it was because they had religion and not that personal relationship with with Jesus Christ. Religion, we're going to find out um, in the next couple weeks how religion serves you. Because we're not allowed to gather together. We're not allowed to be in one place together, serving uh, together. And so all those things that happen uh, that are religious are going to start fading away. And the question is, how, how is our relationship with Jesus Christ going to stand so how can we how can we be committed to christ so that we're not changing our minds like the crowd changed their minds because have you ever heard it said that that you have also crucified christ that your sins have crucified christ there's times where of course i'm not proud of them that i have denied christ that i haven't spoke up when i said when i knew that i should have Certainly when I was in high school and college, um, there was times where I knew that I should stand up and say what, I, what was on my mind and my heart, but I didn't, and I backed down. And so my actions did not match my words. If you would have asked me the very following moment, are you a Christian? I would have said yes. But just knowing that I had just denied the opportunity to speak up for Christ. So how can we... How can we be committed so that we're not waving like the crowds are waving? Because the crowd, again, is screaming, God, you are so good. You are the one that we've been waiting for. And not only that, but then later we're yelling, give us Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. Keep Jesus. Kill him. Here's how we stay committed. First, first, we get our self-centered agendas out of the way. Our self-centered agendas out of the way. See, here's what ends up happening is that that sounds really, really easy. That sounds easy in, in, in a time where we go, okay, well, yeah, I can just focus on Jesus Christ. I'll just, I'll just do whatever 
He wants, not my will, but God's will. And that sounds really good, but I want to challenge you and say, are your words matching your actions? Are your words matching uh, your actions? Unfortunately, uh, growing up is difficult, right? And my son has a difficult time with this. He has a difficult time with anything that goes against his agenda. He wakes up in the morning, he has a plan in his head, he knows exactly what he's going to do, and when his mother or I disrupt his agenda, guess what? There's frustration, there's anger, uh, there's maybe a little bit of an attitude. And so when his agenda is, is interrupted by what we are saying, he becomes very frustrated. So in our lives, when we say we're going to do what God's agenda and put our self-centered agendas away, that's really easy to say, but are our words matching our actions? Are the words uh, that we have said and committed to matching our actions? And secondly, we ask Christ um, what we can do for Jesus. We ask what we can do for Jesus, not what Jesus can do for us. See, this is this is where the crowd went wrong. This is where the crowd went wrong. They knew Jesus as this guy. They praised Him because of what He had done for them. They were praising Him because they knew Him as a man of miracles. They knew Him as a strong man that, that was uh, going to free them from certain things. So listen to some of the reasons why they loved Him. One is that He, was, he did perform miracles. Jesus was serving them. Think about it. All the things that Jesus had done throughout His ministry, He's serving the crowds. And then lastly, it was a, it was a governmental thing. They wanted to come, become, a, to get away from being under the throne of Roman. And so what Jesus did was He would tell them, and I've not come to change the law. I've come to fulfill it. I've come to, I've come to be that guy. And so that He was their release. But in all those things, in all those reasons, it was, what is Jesus doing for me? Me, 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 me. And when Jesus doesn't do for me, then I become frustrated. Then I become uh, less committed. Then I become wondering, where is God in all this? Then I quickly drop into a crowd that says, No, no, you can let Barabbas free because Jesus is not who He says He is. The same crowd that was yelling Hosanna in the highest was only yelling Hosanna in the highest because they were being blessed and given to and being served by Jesus. You want to have a committed relationship with Jesus? I'm telling you, put your self-centered agendas away. And secondly, find out how you can serve Jesus and not Jesus serve you. We got it flipped. We got, we got it flipped a little bit because we believe uh, that Jesus is here to serve us and to fill all of our needs and that He is a wishing well almost and that when it's not, when it doesn't happen for us, then we quickly jump into the other crowd. We jump into the other crowd and saying, nope, I'm gonna, I don't need Jesus right now. Maybe we're not yelling that we need to crucify Jesus. Maybe we're not yelling that we uh, hate Him. But here's what changed. They saw Jesus riding in majestically. Riding in. Larger than life. And as they're yelling to release Barabbas, Jesus was beaten, bruised, battered. And it started, them started thinking, is he who he says he is? Is he capable of doing what, what he promised? And just like that, they flipped. Just like that. They said, nope, I'm out. I'm out. If Jesus can't do for any more, for me anymore, then I'm done with him. I'm done. Think about it. They're standing there seeing this bruised man and they literally look at him and go, he can do nothing else for me. There's nothing else that he can do to help me. And because of that, I turn my back on him. I'm going to challenge you this week that as we go from week to week, um, that you start taking this very, very seriously. That you take your relationship with Jesus very seriously. 
And that you start saying, Jesus Christ, what in the world can I do for you this week? A lot has been left to the pastors. A lot have been left to the ones who are saying, you got to be the ones that reach out now. You do the devotions. You do the sermons. You do the calls. And it's not, I'm not saying that for this church, but I'm saying that for most churches, I imagine that's what it is. And what the people are saying is, serve me, serve me, serve me. It's my turn now. I get to sit in my house. I get to stay home and do it. Do it, Jesus. Serve me. And the real question is, is what should we be doing to serve Jesus Christ? You have an endless opportunity with social media, with YouTube, with whatever it is, whatever avenue, you have an endless opportunity. You th- the sermons, that, the devotions that I'm, I'm putting on are reaching 300, 600 people. I don't know how that is even possible. But in a time where we look at Jesus Christ, look at our relationship and say, what can I do for Jesus? Your relationship, this now is not the time to be casual with Christ. He never called for us to be casual. He never gave us suggestions. He never gave us suggestions, only commandments. Only the things that He's saying, this is what you need to be doing. So how can we not change our minds over and over like, this is my favorite color, this is my favorite color, I like Jesus now, I don't need Jesus now, as long as He can help me, I'll take Him. As long as I can, he can do for me, I'll take him. How do we get away from that? That we, we buckle down, we set our self-agendas aside, our self-centered agendas aside, and we say, how can we do things for Christ right now? Because next week we're going to hear about them crucifying Jesus. We're going to hear about how horrible that was. But yet, our sin is what separates us from Christ. The things that we do uh, separate us from Christ um, and the love of Christ. And so my question to you this morning is in your own homes, in your quiet places, in your time, let's not reject Jesus. Let's not have this relationship with Him that says, if He does for me, I'll love Him. If not, you can kill Him. Because that's exactly what the crowd said. This week, let's find ways to reach out, to extend, and to do ministry for Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You that uh, You have given us uh, Scripture that we can follow, that we can read. Lord, I I thank You that um, we can all be challenged by Your Word. Lord, I pray that this week that we would draw close to You, that we would be um, near to You, and that we would ask ourselves, what can we do uh, for Jesus. Maybe it's serving others. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's a card. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. But Lord, maybe we can ask ourselves how uh, we can stop being casual with You um, and that we can be intentional with You. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your, your love. And I pray, Amen. Where you are in your home, I'm going to ask that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that you set aside to become a a Christian, that you would invite Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. And, And it sounds difficult, and it is. It's a difficult path. The Bible says that um that the path is narrow, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. So right now at your home would you do that? Would you pray that God would enter your heart? That you would pray that you, uh, He would forgive you of your sins? The whole reason why we have Palm Sunday and Easter is because Christ was here on a mission. And that was to die for your sins and mine. And then He rose again. And in that, in that resurrection, He defeated death so that we can live with Him forever. Would you do that this morning? Would you accept Christ into your heart and to your life? Maybe you've been a Christian, but you've fallen away a little bit. Maybe you've um, kind of uh, just backslidden as we've come to here. Or maybe you've just put Jesus Christ on the, on the shelf and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own agenda for now. Let Christ interrupt you. 
Let Christ interrupt your life. Let, let's get back to where we have an intentional relationship with Christ. Or maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you need prayer. Can I do that with you right now? If you're at home and you say, I don't know how to invite Jesus Christ in my heart, this is it. You just pray this prayer. And you believe that Christ died on the cross and rose again. And then from there you stay committed and you go and tell other people about Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, right now where people sit, if they need to invite you into their heart and into their lives, Lord, I pray that they would do that right now by just saying, God, I know you're there. I know you're real. I want to have a relationship with you. I believe in you. I believe that you came to this earth and that you died on a cross and you rose again. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to stay on a path and cultivate a relationship with you that's intentional. God, for those that have fallen away, Lord, I pray that you would relight a fire in their lives. Lord, that you would break revival out right now wherever they are. That they would, revival would break out in their homes and their hearts. But we learned last week that we are the temple. We are the body of Christ. And that you want to do good work in us. And that you want to dwell in our temples, in our hearts. And just help your people react differently to, to difficult situations. And God, I pray for those that are hurting, and that are sick, that are scared, that have no direction, that are overwhelmed, that are anxious. God, right now, touch them. Give them the peace uh, that you can only give. Lord, bring healing to their hearts and to their minds. And we thank you for your word. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to stand up in your home as we sing this song. That you would rejoice if you prayed for revival, that you would stand up and that you would sing this song and that you would raise your hands to God above knowing that He died on a cross, that I'm not going to be a part of that crowd anymore that yells, crucify Him, that says, I'm going to have this casual relationship with Him anymore. I want to be part of the crowd that says, today is the day that I will follow Jesus for the rest of my life.
so grateful that you uh, came to um, worship with us this morning. We have a slide up here. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. I know we've had lots of questions about how to give. Um, You can tithe um, your uh, your tithe online at www.fortlewisbaptistchurch.org. You can just follow the links. If you don't tithe um, online, you can send in your tithe to 4215 West Main Street, Salem, Virginia, 24153. We still tithe because we still are doing ministries. Amen. And so, um, if the Lord leads you to do that, I pray that you would. Um, and this is a super easy way uh, to do that. Thank you. And God bless.